Hello and welcome. Welcome, everybody. My name is Suzanne St. John Crane, and I'm uh, Executive Director of uh, ALF National, and um, I am the CEO of American Leadership Forum Silicon Valley. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our our gathering today. Um, just so thrilled that you're you're able to be here uh, for what promises to be um, a stimulating, informative, fascinating conversation and presentation with Otto Scharmer, who is uh, a a um, a person who is near to near and dear to our heart as we've used uh, uh, his curriculum here in the Fellows Program. Uh, for decades. So I first just want to welcome everyone and and offer a few things to you all uh, in terms of, of uh, our, our day today, our time together and what's going on with ALF. I know we mostly have ex um, senior fellows here and um, uh, some folks who are friends of ALF, right? Uh, so for those of you that aren't familiar with us, our work is to join and strengthen diverse leaders, creating and nurturing networks for good. We're a 40 year old organization. Uh, and we have 5,000 graduates, 5,000 senior fellows uh, in 46 states, which is pretty incredible. Of course, our team um, has been working very, very hard. And if you're a senior fellow, you know this very, very hard at uh, getting ALF Connect online. So I just want to give a, a shout out to Mark Tolley on the Silicon Valley staff, uh, who's been working tirelessly to ensure that we, we launch this this week. This will allow the 5,000 senior fellows to be connected on an online platform tool, a vibrant uh, alumni platform. So we're so excited that uh, this is the first time that we're going to be able to do this together. So if you are a senior fellow, please do join that platform so that we can be together in the uh, in the virtual world and, and communicate with each other easily. So our Invitation Only Fellows Program puts accomplished leaders across sectors and relationship and dialogue together in order to raise consciousness and um, uh, help us make decisions that benefit the whole. Uh, and so we have represent representatives from several chapters here today. Uh, so glad to see you all. Um, so one of the things that we do here at ALF is we offer a land acknowledgement. So I'm gonna do that now. And then following that, um, we will be uh, introduced, well, we're gonna do a little bit of a get to know you exercise with folks as I see them coming in the room here um, and then uh, turn it over to our guest of honor, uh, guest of honor, Otto Sharmer. Say that three times twice, three times fast. Um, so first we would like to begin with a land acknowledgement and thanks to those that are putting um, putting their uh, uh, land of, of ancestors there into the, into the chat. Um, we would like to begin with a land acknowledgement as a way to recognize our interconnectedness and responsibilities across history and in our multicultural community today. Across Silicon Valley and the Bay Area, we're on the land of the Ohlone. Others joining from across the U.S. are on other tribal lands. Uh, we thank the past, present, and future generations of these tribes. And as we gather for the purpose of leadership for the common good, uh, let's remember that to create a truly inclusive community and democracy, we must work to unpack our history of colonialism and dismantle current systems of injustice so that all people in our communities can thrive. So a little get to know you exercise before we uh, we jump into our presentation uh, presentation today. I would love to know, um, you know, one word, one phrase. I would love to invite you, I should say, for one word, one phrase about what you're bringing into the space today. What's on your mind? Maybe what what got you here? What what got you to sign up for this? And and so this is an opportunity for us to hopefully meet some folks outside of our chapters or maybe inside that we haven't met yet. Uh, and and just say hello, just to a quick ALF check-in. For folks that are not familiar with the ALF check-in, it's really an opportunity to to, for us to see each other as people first before we dive into learning and into into uh, into content, as it were, for us to to get fully present, which is perfect given our our uh, our theme today and our conversation today. So, Mark, I'm going to ask you to to uh, to please put us into breakouts just for a couple minutes. And what I'd like you to do again is just share your name, region, uh, you know, one word or phrase. Check in about. Hopefully, you had a chance to chance to say hi, to check in, to meet a senior fellow who you don't know, and um, uh, do our traditional ALF check-in. So 
Before we jump in, in what I'd like to do too is just recognize a very special guest that we have with us today. Um, joining us today, and I'm going to put you on the spot a second here, Joseph, is ALF's founder, Joseph Jaworski, uh, who's joining us uh, for this illustrious dialogue. Hi, Joseph. I'm putting you on the spot just to say hi. <laughs> Hello, Suzanne. It's so good to be with you and and with all the others. I'm really excited to be here to learn and and to connect up with my old uh, colleague, uh, Otto Schormer. Wonderful, wonderful. We're delighted that you're here. And, and I know I told Otto just before this that Joseph's coming. It's all fantastic. So, cool. so wonderful. Welcome, welcome, my friend. Yeah, uh, thank you. Well done. You bet, you bet. You bet. Uh, so why don't we dive in? Let's dive into to, uh, the content. What I'd like to do is introduce our special guest, Otto Shermer, uh, who, Otto, I think you and I connected almost, um, maybe it was through the pandemic, and I just reached out, and, and then we were off and running. You happened to be here in Silicon Valley when Class 42 was meeting to talk about Theory U and, and actually met in person with them. It's just been a, a joy to, to get to know you a bit better. And for folks on the call... Otto is a senior lecturer at MIT, founding chair of the Presencing Institute. He's dedicated the past 20 years to helping leaders embrace cross-sector systems transformations. You understand now why ALF is so interested in his work and uh, has used it for, for years. So through his best-selling books, Theory U and Presence, uh, Otto introduced the groundbreaking concept of presencing, learning from the emerging future. He's also co-authored Leading from the Emerging Future, uh, which outlines eight acupuncture points. I love that description. Eight acupuncture points for transforming our economy from egocentric to ecocentric. And that is one of my favorite phrases to use, Otto, of yours, uh, when we, we talk to the fellows program and the senior fellows uh, in, uh, groups. His most recent, uh, or one of his uh, recent books, The Essentials of Theory You summarizes the core principles and applications of awareness-based systems change. He also co-founded the MITXU Lab, activating a vibrant worldwide ecosystem of change makers involving more than 240,000 users from 186 countries. So as I shared, ALF's been teaching Theory U as a core part of our curriculum for decades. And we're so blessed to have Otto with us to share his most recent thoughts and framework on systems change in 2024 and beyond. So I turn it over to you, my friend, Otto. Share, share what you have. We can't wait to learn. All right, thank you so much, uh, Suzanne. So let me just go on gallery that I'm not looking at myself. Well, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's wonderful to be with you all together. And uh, uh, in particular, uh, Joseph, uh, such a wonderful opportunity to reconnect. And one of the books that you mentioned, Suzanne, uh, Presence was actually uh, co-authored by Joseph and myself uh, together with Peter Sengi and, Peter Su uh, and Betty Sue Flowers. And um, so it's just, um, that's kind of an ALF, kind of back in the day when Joseph and I were de developing all the foundations uh, for this, essentially kind of a deeper view of leadership and systems, systems change. Uh, I always heard from Joseph all these, and I of course know it from synchronicity, all the great stories around uh, founding the ALF and so on. So I, um, I always, uh, you know, you know, that was kind of like a, a almost mystic thing for me, right? And then when you wrote me, so, but I never had any kind of real direct connection other than uh, uh, Joseph and I. And so when you connected me, I, I was really um, uh, pleased to, to make a direct connection uh, sometimes last year. And of course, um, then you find out all the uh, hidden connections. So thank you for inviting me into your circle here. And um what I would like to share is a little bit the evolution of uh, systems thinking. And I will essentially share uh, uh, two images with you. The first one is uh, this one here. And uh, this one you know very well. Um, uh, let me just get rid of some of these. OK. Um, so the first one, you know, um, pretty well and that's kind of the iceberg model right that's really the backdrop of our conversation the poly crisis the the, the three divides the ecological divide social divide spiritual divide and um then um you know 
what is it that we are facing uh, or that what, what we are noticing when we look at the current way of operating from a systems view, we collectively create results that nobody wants, right? That's kind of the, the current situation in terms of the environmental destruction, social inequality, and, you know, all the symptoms of mental health and depression and uh, anxiety and so forth. Now, um, as you know, theory U or kind of uh, awareness-based systems change, to use another term, and all systems thinking really um, is asking the question, why? So why is it that, you know, on the surface here, right, above the waterline, we create these uh, symptoms that individually nobody wants, and yet collectively we do create them. And systems thinking is really then um, trying to understand and address these deeper root issues below the, uh, below the waterline, structures, paradigms of thought, and the deeper sources mm -hmm. of creativity, of um, energy, and of, of, of presence and of identity that we are operating from. And, uh, you know, if you want to summarize this approach of awareness-based systems change that... Um, uh, you know, many of us have been working on, I will, put, I will put it in this way, you cannot change a system unless you transform consciousness, right? And, and what does that mean? It means what you talked about, Suzanne, right? From ego to eco, essentially, right? From a silo to a systems view. Then the second thing we learned is you can't transform consciousness until you make a system see and sense itself. You need to look into the mirror, but not only with your head, to, you need a sense into it with your heart, right? That's the sensing part. And then the last one is you can't lead systems transformation until you sense and presence the emerging future. Essentially, you know, and, until you sense and step into the uh, emerging future. So that's the backdrop, right? That's kind of what uh, we have been um, developing over the years, kind of, uh, that's kind of what um, uh, Joseph and I, uh, it's, it's kind of, um, and, and Peter and others kind of, that's kind of really the deeper foundations here. But my question now is, all right, so how do we really put that to work? So we have had the iceberg model for 100 years in systems thinking and systems complexity. Is there a moment now with the poly crisis that we face where we need to update that a little bit, right? Uh, maybe after 100 years, the 21st century, we need a new central metaphor of systems thinking. And here are two sources of inspiration. The first one is when um, uh, the uh, chemist and Nobel laureate Ilya Prigogine, when a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence and a sea of chaos have the capacity to lift the entire system to a higher order. So, so he talks about this bifurcation points, right? So when, when a system is in that state, small groups of people can, uh, can have an outsized impact with their, with their actions. So the small islands of coherence. I think it's a very important sentence and principle because um, it is calling on each and every one of us to really activate our own agency. The other source of transformation, uh, of, of inspiration, is this. Uh, and that's basically where I grew up, right? Uh, the field of the farmer. I grew up on a farm. Uh, in fact, kind of my farmers were regenerative farmers who 65 years ago converted to really regenerative methods. So when you look at systems from a field point of view, right, from the viewpoint of a regenerative farmer, right, which, which I kind of, is, is but just the environment I grew up in, this is what we see, right? So we see um, uh, on the... Um, uh, we see uh, <clears throat> we see uh, above the ground social systems, right? Kind of what we so okay, so. Let me let me just um, go back. So so I'm looking at the field of the farmer. That's really what I learned from my parents. There is really just as with the icebergs, there is two parts, which is 
the part that's visible to the eye above the ground, right, above the soil. And then there's the soil and the ground, kind of what's uh, the quality of the soil, the seeds, kind of everything that grows below the surface. And when we look through that lens, what we see is above the ground, uh, you know, when we apply that lens to social systems, so then we see above the ground the observ the observable reality, right? The tangible stuff. But then below the ground, right? The social soil. What is the social soil? It is really the quality of our awareness and the quality of our relationships. So essentially, the the approach of theory U and of all versions of awareness-based systems change is saying something simple, which is what we see above the ground, the quality of the results is a function of the quality of the soil. It's a, it's a function of the quality of our relationships and of our awareness, right, of our consciousness. So that's kind of, there is a relationship and the leverage point is to improve the quality of the soil. So that's essentially the metaphor here. Then I want to, you to, you know, consider, and I, I want to guide that. And you can almost see that as a little bit as like a reality meditation now. So there is, um, you know, when we look at systems today, what do we see? I mean, you see all the systems that you already know, right? So it's, um, it's the stuff you know, and uh, above the ground. And then what do we see? Um, in terms of evolution of these systems. And I think we see something very interesting, which is basically the same thing. They go through the same kind of transformations. You could say the same kind of upgrading of their operating system. In agriculture, it is from industrial agriculture to sustainable ag, right? You do less bad. And from sustainable ag, ag to regenerative agriculture, food as medium for healing planet and people. So it's not reducing bad stuff, but it's really kind of becoming a force for good, if you want. In education, teaching for testing, to student-centric modes of learning. And from there, what's really happening now, and we are just starting a major project with the OECD around that with uh, several different leading countries, Education for human flourishing, really kind of education by activating head, heart, and hand. In health, right, it's coming from evidence-based medicine to extending that, you know, reorganizing the health system around the patient journey. And from there, what's really being discussed now is focusing on the sources of health, not just on the symptoms of sickness, and, this, and in particular, the sources of planetary health. Um, sustainability in business, right? From efficiency to, uh, you know, it's, it's basically that's where you have recycling, that's where you have resource efficiency and all these things towards really sustainability as a driver for innovation. And now we reinvent our core business. And from there, really what you see now, business as a force for good. And what that means is that sustainability begins to transform the purpose of business. Finance, from extractive finance to impact investing and ESG, and from there to regenerative finance, which is really about investing finance more upstream towards systems transformation, towards regenerating our social, ecological, and cultural commons. Technology, as you know, that would be a whole session in itself, right? If you really got uh, get into that, we don't have the time, but let's just say this, AI, uh, machine intelligence, right? How to, you know, make that work for all, right? For all of society. I mean, that's really the question here. And it's moving towards um, machine, from machine intelligence to machine usefulness and from there to uh, really technologies that are creativity in life enhancing rather than creativity in life diminishing. Now, you could say, all right, at the end of the day, all these sectors and all these different acupuncture points that I just mentioned, 
are really an expression of governance, right? At the end of the day, it all boils down to governance, right? How we make collective decisions. And that's where we see kind of traditional forms, markets and hierarchies, nation states, and so on, to more really what's going on today, which is everything is multi-stakeholder, right? Multi-stakeholder work, multilateral institution. And now we are in this in-between. Are we moving to the next step, which is awareness-based collective action? So really kind of acting from a shared awareness, which we see in many cases locally in cities, sometimes on a planetary level. Think about the Paris Agreement and so on. But, you know, we also see other tendencies. All right. So basically, um, if, you, if you look at this, what's the interesting part? That as you move from the outer to the inner spheres, you see that the boundaries between these sectors begin to collapse. There is a field of convergence in the center uh, where the level of codependency is just kind of dramatically increased. Now, you may say, okay, so maybe this is a little bit of, a, uh, you know, so it, it's like too much detail. But I, I want to tell you, it's really, there's a very simple basic thought, right? Forget about all the details that I, that I mentioned. The basic simple thought is this, that the evolution of our institutions and systems can be seen as the manifestation of an evolving human consciousness that moves from here, which is ecosystem awareness, to ecosystem awareness, right? Ecosystem awareness, which is silo-based, right? Kind of um, just uh, focusing on direct uh, output and efficiency. And the first extension is user and stakeholder awareness. And we are moving towards really kind of this now, kind of this ecosystem and regeneration centric, uh, which is just the next step. And as we do this, we move into a space of convergence that you can see in the heart of this. And one of the shared challenges, the deeper themes that we all come, uh, come across when we advance these systems change initiatives, it has to do from moving from decolonization to you know, uh, regeneration. So that's basically, Suzanne, what you were kind of uh, alluding to in, in your opening remarks. It has to do with moving from, so, so, it's, so the first one is really from extraction to regeneration. The f second one is really from ego to eco, uh, from a silo to a systems view. And the third one is from reacting against the past towards sensing and actualizing emerging futures, right? Kind of which is what uh, what we refer to with the word uh, presencing. So that's kind of this inner core, right? Of possibility that is really in the world, but that's not fully activated yet. And why is it not fully activated? And the answer has everything to do with the Southern hemisphere of this mirror that you see, kind of this little systems planet here. It has everything to do with the social soil. It has everything to do with what is below the ground. So what is that really? What is kind of this, uh, you know, southern hemisphere of this planet? And that has to do with seven capacities and leadership practices that I think really will be at, at the heart of uh, uh, our future work of transformation. And the first one has to really be has to do with becoming aware, which it has to do with how we pay attention. And so, in other words, it has to do with focusing. This is the core of all meditative practice, as you know, but it's also the core of all leadership, right? Because the core of meditation and leadership is the same. It is about realigning attention and intention. Just that as a meditator, you do that individually. And as a leader, you need to do it in the real world, right? You need to do it kind of in the context of your organizational challenges. So what is the big challenge here? 
cultural ADHD, right? So, so we live in a world where we all deal with ever shortening attention spans. And that's really kind of the core. So I don't need to go into all these stages of how to develop this deeper capacity here, but that's the first one. The second one is something you all know very well, kind of uh, genitive listening, right? Deep listening, really kind of listening with your mind and heart wide open. And what is, why does that matter? Because we live currently in a world of echo chambers, right? That's kind of what uh, technology is, is, is kind of creating around us. Uh, we can't do anything about it. But what, how, how can we can transcend that by deepening our listening, right? Activating our generative listening. Um, so the third practice, the third leadership practice really has to do with generative dialogue. And why does that matter? Because we live in a world where this is happening, silencing and othering, right? Cancel cultures left and right, right? So it's, um, what, what does that really mean? It means kind of we're um, no longer, um, you know, engaging ourselves kind of with um, really uh, in context, kind of, um, you know, with, people who think different, kind of who come with different assumptions. And that's really where you need dialogue. So from debate to reflective dialogue to generative dialogue, and I know kind of that's kind of really at the, that's also at the core. So all three things I have described is really at the core of the ALF leadership work. Now, then of course, there is, um, you know, this Sen deep sensing, right? Not only sensing, but deep sensing. So presencing is really deep sensing, sensing what is wanting to emerge. And why does that matter? Because we, walled in a, we live in a world of mass depression. What does depression do? It's disconnecting us from our deepest sources of creativity. What does deep sensing and presencing do? It's reconnecting us. So that's why this is really kind of one, it's, uh, it is one is the antidote for the other. And, you know, the opening of the mind, the heart, the will, kind of that's kind of what, what, what is really the foundational work that Joseph and I and others kind of have been um, contributing towards. Now, okay, so that's kind of the left hand side here. The bottom left is really about the more interpersonal leadership skills. But let's now go to the right hand side, which is really about the institutional leadership side that each of us is also involved in. So there is ecosystem leadership, right? Which is leadership beyond just your own area of responsibility. And why does that matter? Because we live in a world that sees kind of a resurgence, a resurfacing of, of, of a lot of author, author, authoritarian forms of leadership. So this has to do with the evolution of leadership from traditional forms to participative forms to humble or we would say perhaps an ALF um, servant forms of leadership. Um, Cross-sector co-creation. How do we work together across sectors, right? Anyone, you know, in, in all the real challenges, we do cross-sector work. You do it in ALF. So um, why does that matter? Because we live in a context of hyperpolarization and war, right? Which is the absence of working, you know, in productive ways across boundaries. And so here we see really an evolution of also civic engagement from advocacy to multi-stakeholder processes to really new infrastructures that enable co-sensing and co-creating. And I would say what you are really doing with ALF, what you are prototyping, you are kind of moving into that directions, but we need a lot more of that in our communities, of course. And then, you know, governance, ecosystem governance really is. So autoc why does that matter? Autocracy, okay, we know that, the rule of one. What is cacistocracy? It is the rule of the worst. And that's, of course, what we can observe, right? The worst in terms of the least qualified. So that's another mega trend that we have. And uh, we all see it uh, and know the examples. No need to go into details here. But that's kind of, um, so really ecosystem governance is really 
our capacity to create forms of making sense and um, uh, um, you know and coordinating in a way that is grounded in a shared awareness of what it is we are dealing with today and what it is that we are trying to do. Shared awareness of, um, of attention and intention in a community. So that's base, that's what I would say. Those are the seven capacities kind of that really matter, kind of uh, on the left-hand side, more on the interpersonal, then more on the cross-sectoral side. And I would say that is one story today, right? So it's the evolution from 2.0 to 4.0. And to do that, we need to activate, we need to cultivate the social soil. But then there's this other story. And the other story has everything to do with, you know, what we know so well, technology, right? Mass misinformation uh, uh, together with mass polarization, mass depression that I mentioned before, three of the unintended side effects, right, of social media. Then kind of we have um, hyper extract. So we have um, uh, on, on the financial side, um, So um, uh, forms of um, hyper, uh, you know, uh, hyper inequality. And, you know, when you think about uh, business, what's happening in the fossil fuel industry, kind of it's really patterns of hyper uh, extraction. Um, in health, kind of, you could say it's um, uh, opioidization, and then in education, think about all the book banning and so on. We have um, we have also kind of um, you know we have progress towards human flourishing, but we also have a backlash there. So if you uh, basically you know the other story is indicated in this outer circle. And if we look at these 11 phenomena, right, both in the north and in the south of this visual here, you can ask yourself, what is it really? So is this 11 different problems or is it one and the same? So what is the deeper pattern language here? And I would say it's this. It is the matrix of manipulation. And um, so... The interesting thing is that the manipulation actually works, right? That's why it's a trillion dollar industry, right? That the social media is a trillion dollar industry. Why? Because it works. You can manipulate behavior on the human behavior on the level of the collective. And um, that, of course, is uh, is part of, um, of the problem uh, that we face. So those are the two stories, right? So we are kind of living in a historic moment where kind of, uh, you know, we have like diverging forces or clashing forces of being pulled backwards, but also having strong momentum moving forwards. And um, it comes really with a choice that each and every one has to do, kind of what it is, kind of we want to be um, in service of. So... Uh, and, you know, working towards kind of the space of possibility towards regeneration, ego to ego uh, and presencing, of course, is, uh, is one of these possibilities that, um, uh, that more and more of us, so on the level of, indiv of individual, but also uh, on the level of organizations and so on, we, we, we are going to make more conscious uh, choices around. So um, you could say, uh, so I want to, you know, with one word, further simplify what is said, right? So you have, and basically, I want to offer you a simple image for everything in the lower half here in the Southern Hemisphere. All these seven capacities are not seven different things. They're essentially manifestation of one and the same thing, which is moving out of a way of operating that you see here, which is basically where we are stuck inside our own bubbles towards a new way of operating, right? Kind of where we 
connect with through opening our mind, opening our heart, connect with and operating from uh, what's happening around us, kind of what's happening in our environment, kind of with Mother Nature, with you know the the communities around us, kind of with the the, the ecosystems that we are part of. So you could say, you know, deepening the listening, deepening the conversation, ecosystem leadership, and so on. It's all, all of them are expressions of one and the same thing, which is moving out of our own bubble and up beginning to operate not only from the emerging future, but also from uh, a more connect, for a, a direct connection to really what's, uh, what's happening. Um, um, what's happening um, around us. So if that's, um, you know, if this is true, you could ask yourself, okay, so where's actually my attention, right? So when I look at this as a mirror here, so on this northern hemisphere, right? It's kind of, you have like probably more than one here. You have multiple of these. And where is it? Am I like in the 2.0, 3.0, 4.0? Where is really, where do I put most of my hours, most of my energy? And then on the southern side, the bottom left, the interpersonal things, where, where is it, right? So most of my time, is it like factual? Is it empathic? Is it generative listening? Those are really kind of, so those are, good questions to ask yourself where do you put your lifetime your energy um and then also here on the bottom right the more institutional leadership side the same questions apply so you can use this really as a mirror right and ask yourself as an individual as an organization maybe even as a larger community where is it kind of what's kind of our what is it where is it we try to move the dial and where is it we are kind of uh, investing most of our energy? So if this is true, right? Small islands of coherence and a sea of chaos have the capacity to lift the entire system to a higher order. What is our role as ALF? What is our role as a movement? Um, what is really kind of uh, in a moment, because this story here in the center, right? The, 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 this, the, this emerging, this um, uh, space of convergence that we see there in an interesting way, that is the most significant story of our time that is least well told and most underattended to. But it will not be actualized if we don't at attend to that. You know, energy follows attention. Whatever we pay attention to as leaders, that's where the energy goes. So let me close with, you know, just to give the Presencing Institute as an example. If we want to do all this stuff here, right? Okay, planetary healing and civilization, SDGs, all these things, all right? What I believe really is there's only one way of doing it which is shifting social fields, which is kind of improving the quality of the social soil, right? The, the, um, uh, the shifting from extractive to regenerative, from ego to ego. And the only way of doing that, that's really what we have learned in leadership over the years, is here by creating a support structure, right? That provides this inner, this interior space that has largely no support space now. That's why what ALF does, that's why what, what Presencing Institute does is it matters today. And what does that do? It is democratizing access to the methods and tools for you know, transformational leadership, you could say. And it's helping us to upgrade the operating system across all these verticals, right? Across all these sectors kind of that we discussed. So I don't need to go over here, but you know, so we in the Presencing Institute, we have prototyped that, you know, pretty much across the board. And, um, you know, including, and I think there is a groundswell in the world right now. So this is here, Latin America, an ecosystem activation program over three years, 230 people, 
you know, from 19 different countries, there's an enormous bottom up energy and here kind of cross sector groups from Southeast Asia and Indonesia and, um, you know, that part of the world. So I think across the planet, we have communities coming together uh, and beginning to attend to that. Yet, at the larger scale, we all know it's still kind of tiny and small in the larger scheme of things. So this is really what I want to leave you with, right? If you look at this mirror here, where is, and you look at your own work, when I say you, I mean you personally, I mean you, you as an organization or maybe your community, right? You as an ALF, what, what is it when, when you look at your work, what is, where is your current focus no, now? Where do you spend most of your hours? Where do you exert most of your energy? One. Number two, moving forward, where do you want that primary focus to be, both on the northern side and on the southern side? So going forward, what is your intention? I mean, that's one thing what you do now, but what is your intention? What do you think you should be doing at you, with you, kind of you personally, but also your organization and so forth? And then lastly, if those two things are different, what's holding you back? What, what really are the, the obstacles there? And that's really what systems thinking is, right? We need to identify the obstacles because if we don't identify them, we can't remove them. So those are maybe three questions to contemplate. And with that, Susanna, back to you. So much to think about. Wow. Thank you so much, Otto, for sharing that. Um, you know, how do we how do we upgrade our operating system right? <laughs> so that we can function at a function at a higher consciousness and have better outcomes? Um, really appreciate you sharing that. Friends, what we're going to do right now is just give you like 15 minutes to be in community with each other in some breakouts to contemplate those questions that Otto shared with us. And then when we come back, we're going to do some Q&A with Otto. So your questions and um and have more of a group dialogue about this that that i'll help facilitate but for right now i just want yes looks like it wonderful well i hope you had a stimulating conversation to process all that you you were able to uh, experience in the presentation and had a chance to to ask questions and and listen and engage in some good conversation with with fellow senior fellows or friends what we'd like to do now is I want to go back to some of the questions that you all asked uh, in the chat. And Otto, you and I, you know, I'd love to, to pose some of these to you. But also, I want to make sure that we just have time for a, a generative conversation here um, beyond just those questions. So let's knock some of these out first and then uh, want to open it up for some more some more dialogue as we have time. We've got about 23 minutes left in our time together today. So um, first question up here. So please post some in the chat if you have more, but we're, we're going to try and knock these out uh, rather quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the challenges that we have, Otto, is, you know, clearly we need to upgrade our operating system to 4.0. How do we get philanthropy to invest in relationship building, uh, philanthropy donors to invest in relationship building so organizations who do this work can do more of it? Thoughts and and question you know reflections on that Otto. <laughs> That's almost funny because uh, Maureen uh, uh, and I and others kind of in our group. That's exactly what we just talked about. And yeah. what I said is, I mean, it's really a, a tr true and authentic reflection of my work. The most important work I'm doing <clears throat> is the least fundable. Right. Yeah. It means yeah. I can't fund it. Right. And whatever I can fund is not important. So what, what do you do then? You cross fund, right? You get pi paid for something that's funding something else. But that is, you know, that, that's working to some degree. But if you really need to be, uh, you know, more bold, right, in moving forward, that's no longer working. So I think there is really a missing literacy, particularly in the philanthropic sector, uh, that has, um, you know, that's really, if you fund um, 
only things that are measurable short term mm -hmm. um, you by definition exclude everything that's systemic everything that's below the surface of the soil mm -hmm. and um, so that's really where the current philanthropic uh, paradigm is um, creating more harm than good to some degree because you know it, it calls itself philanthropy but it's really draining resources for the cultivation of the soil and that's where i mean in a way if you look at the entire financial sector it's not that complicated right we have too much as a society too much money in one place and too little money in another one where do we have too much extractive finance right that's 99.9 .9 of everything and where do we have too little regenerating our ecological, social, and cultural comments. Mm. And that needs different money. It needs gift money. And kind of it, you know, uh, yeah, you can, uh, you know, uh, talk about business model until the cows come home. But, you know, that's not, I think we have not really figured out how to use the power of money as a force for good. And that's one of the biggest challenges we have. It's the same with technology, you could say, right? We, we, we figured out how we use it as a force for, you know, a few individuals to build an empire, but um, it's not a force for good. It's not a force for human and planetary flourishing, but it could be, it could be easily. So that's kind of the conversation that we need to have. Maybe it is in pockets, but perhaps not enough. And there's, that's a that's a that's a nuanced conversation too. And there's a lot of layers to that, for sure. Um, one other question from folk, uh, somebody on the call: Generative dialogue happens between people who acknowledge each other's basic shared humanity. Hundred percent. How do we have that dialogue within self-perpetuating systems of oppression and power hoarding? Three days ago. Um... Johan Galtung, the father of peace research, uh, passed away in Oslo, Norway. Mm. And um, so he, he developed an approach to, uh, he basically established kind of peace research as a science because we have a lot of war and uh, security stuff. But so what he says is, um, you know, there will, with, that approach, you are not creating peace, but if you create peace, then you create security. So, and what he means with that is that, yes, there is like dialogue, there is deep understanding for each other, but if that goes at the expense of addressing the deeper root issues below the waterline, the root issues deeper, kind of where you have structural violence, for example, which is really excluding certain groups from certain uh, opportunities. Mm. Then it's just kind of uh, putting a nice face on something that really needs to be talked about. So I would say dialogue um, is a really useful. Dialogue is not about agreeing with each other. It's not about being polite with each other. Dialogue is the capacity to surface the deeper assumptions and differences that we have with each other that we need to talk about in order to make sense, in order to move forward. So, um, yes, real, um, I think, um, you know, we have, and for, for leaders, right? So we have, you know, our experience with that through Black Lives Matters kind of, I think we, we are actually making progress. But what we have been learning along the way is, that if you want to be an effective leader, right, in one of the mainstream institutions in such a moment, what you really need to become comfortable with is not knowing, number one, right? Access you're not knowing. Number two, getting beyond your comfort zone, right? Be getting comfortable with uh, not being comfortable, right? Accessing, not shying away from challenging conversations. That's number two. And number three is, so you could say it's kind of not, so the first one is access not knowing. The second one is access not feeling comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. And the third one is, act, uh, so is um, 
access to not react, right? It's stillness. It's strategic stillness. Imagine what would have happened, right, if um, after the uh, terrible attacks, right, at 10-7, right, October 7, if not that reaction that we see now and that everyone could have predicted would have played out. Imagine the space of possibility that would have been. And, and there are examples for that, right, in India. And so there is, so strategic stillness is the capacity of leading by not reacting, but accessing what? So what is not reacting? It means you need to access your stillness. And that's really, so I would say in an ALF curriculum, right, and in this context, we train that muscle. We train that muscle to be less reactive and more um, intentional in when and how we move into action. Thank you for sharing that answer and that perspective. Um, a couple of folks have brought up this question, which I was curious about too. Um, I think it was our friend Chris Block who said, um, the social sector is missing from your sec uh, sector schema. Why? And then Camille followed up with curious how you might break down the social sector, nonprofits and philanthropy on the top half of the mirror. Uh, so that's actually good. So both of those are really good comments. I would say for me, the social sector is what? It's in the Southern Hemisphere. It's really the cross sector. So sometimes I actually call that one, not cross sector, but I call it NGO. It's really the civic engagement. And if you look at the evolution of governance, right, which is really, uh, you know, democratizing decision making into more participatory, participatory uh, forms, uh, it's all really kind of all innovation, both in, uh, in government, but also in business is, is driven by really NGOs, kind of by, by civic participation and uh, engagement. And that's kind of where the enabling infrastructure really is um so it's kind of i would say it's it, it's more important than just one of the sectors it's part of the soil it's the foundation right. of everyone else to e evolve and with the money i mean so yeah i i mean i actually wrote a whole paper that that you know uh, you know i'm also happy to share it's some, i don't know it's, it should be sitting somewhere on my homepage. um Philanthropy 4.0, right? Basically, an evolution of philanthropy, which I would love to get also comments on because it's really a puzzle for me, kind of how how this um, how this is working out. And so, and I was wondering where that really fits. Is that in on the lower half? Current, yeah. you know, you could also say this is really about rethinking the entire financial sector because I think we needed this imbalance that I was talking about. To me. Uh, the philanthropic sector really is in the regenerative finance, right? Because that's okay. really where we need new formats. And it, it, it won't be just philanthropy, but the gift uh, of philanthropy is to really creating new models there that could be replicated elsewhere. So that's how it's sitting in my mind. But uh, I have been, it's a good question. And I'm, I'm actually not 100% sure. All of this is work in progress. If you have a better idea, let me know. Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm just kind of trying to, to evolve that. Yeah, no. And I I think folks may may know this, but might not, that this is really new. These are new slides, new thinking, a new kind of framework that Otto's put together and he's sharing with us, probably one of the first groups you're, you're sharing, sharing this with. So um, it is a, a work in progress, as he said. So these comments I know are helpful, helpful to you, Otto, as you as you evolve, uh, evolve the framework. Um, one more question, and then I'd love to unhighlight us, Richard, and actually have more of a, a group dialogue and encouraging anybody to raise your hand if you've got a comment or a question. But this this last one I really appreciated, which is, what have you seen as the main credible things, competing priorities that get in the way of individuals and institutions opening their heart and then having an open will? What keeps pulling us away from this wisdom? I have an answer to that, but I want to hear yours. <laughs> Well, I want to hear yours. I mean, I, I think I, I will be, I, I'm not, I think uh, we discussed that in our small group as well. I think a lot is um, 
missing so so I, i'm not going and oh people are missing this or that or ethics and so on i think it's not it's like be, because people are too it's, i don't believe in any of that because what i have seen i think each and every one of us has all these things right we all have an ego we all have an ego kind of we all can operate one way or another so what's missing is more intelligent environments that support and strengthen the ego so for example in our case one of um, us was sharing a story going on like uh, finding your purpose right first two versions of that last year kind of doing it alone and kind of you and you find you know you end up with some purpose where it's really all about yourself right and then the second times together with nature together with some uh, community involvement same activity same questions suddenly an entirely different result i think that is such a telling story and that is why alf and these kinds of infrastructures matter so there's a lot of sensing going on in the world uh but what's the problem it's all in the silos it's all in the sectors it's all in the organizations it's all in the uh, strategy departments right so it's um it's all stuck in some version of an ego silo but what we miss what we are missing is these enabling co-sensing infrastructures that if in place allow all of us quite easily kind of to become a part of a bigger picture right be beginning to play a bigger game right and where so the uh what is the 4.0 this inner core that i try to visualize yeah. that's kind of it is our blind spot today right institutionally speaking it doesn't exist institutionally and that's why it's important because that is really kind of the the hidden web of connection that's already there and if you create holding spaces for that it is quite organic how we move into that and all of you know that i see some of you nodding from mm -hmm. your alf experience that's exactly what that is and so wherever you put these holding structures into place human beings move into this direction right it's not hard right it, it's not like but it's what is the hard part putting that enabling infrastructure up because in a in a world where you can only find what's the least important i mean i, I i'm not ending the sentence but be, because we are missing the literacy to understand how significant our upstream collaboration, co-sensing and co-creating really is. Yeah. And that's why it's random and accidental today. But if it were more systemically supported, I think we would actualize the potential that's already there in the world a lot more. According to a recent poll, three out of four people in G20 countries right now support transformation of our economic and societal systems towards better addressing climate change and social inequality. Three out of four. Kind of that's the potential. What's not happening with our current institutional structure? Exactly that. So we are moving actually in part in the other direction. That's why the stuff and the holding space in the center matters more so anyway i think i talked enough i want to turn it over to joseph and Otto, we are actually out of time but i'm going to let joseph say a couple things here but i do want to encourage folks to please take the survey to let us know kind of how we did today so that this is really helpful for us so we're going to stay on just for a couple more minutes if you want to stay with us but um uh richard is going to share something about alf connect and our survey which we'll also send out to you all but uh uh, really appreciate Otto the conversation today. So grateful. And Joseph, you want to say a final something and close us out, my friend? Thank you, Suzanne. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Otto, thank you. That was absolutely marvelous. And uh, it was a great learning experience for all of us. My, my closing comment is that everything that Otto has said and every, uh, most of everything that was um, embraced in the questions and comments can be boiled down in my mind to, to one thing, and that is activating the capacity for love. 
Mm. Uh, love, Otto and I have spent hours together talking about this and the uh, fact that love is the most powerful energy in the world or in the universe. And that's what I saw running throughout all of Otto's comments and uh, observations. So thank you. I love that. Oh, Joseph, thanks so much for being here. And I want to invite all of you to contemplate that. How will you activate your capacity for love as a leader? And uh, that's a, a great way to, to kind of close our conversation today. Um, please share your feedback in the link in the, the chat. There's a link right there you can click on. And so grateful. We will see you all on ALF Connect. Please respond to that uh, invitation on the 22nd. And thanks for staying a few minutes after. Um, Otto, Joseph, and Mark and staff are going to go into a breakout and wish you all well on the uh, rest of your week. So thank you so much, friends. <laughs>